Okay, so let's get started. It's uh, three o'clock. Welcome everyone to the Distinguished Lecture Series of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. Special welcome to everyone joining us online and also to everyone joining us in person here. Uh, it's a particular pleasure today to introduce uh, Joyce Poon. Uh, Joyce is a uh, Max Planck Director at the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics in Halle where she heads the Department of Nanophotonics Integration and Neural Technology. She's originally from Hong Kong, and sh then she did her undergraduate studies in the University of Toronto before she moved to Caltech, where she completed her PhD in 2007 with Amnon Yarif uh, on slow light and waveguides. She then very quickly took up a professor position at the University of Toronto. And in uh, 2019, uh, she moved to become Max Planck Director in Halle, uh, she, I think, retains her affiliation with University of Toronto, and she is also a honorary professorship at the Technical University of Berlin. So sh the field she is working in is, broadly speaking, silicon integrated photonics for various uh, purposes like computing, communication, or neurotechnology, and I guess you will hear more about that uh, today. She also won a number of awards. At some point, she was named one of the uh, 35 top innovators under 35. She's won IBM faculty awards and university uh, faculty award uh, uh, from the Canadian National uh, Research Council. Um, and in 2018, she was named a fellow of Optica. And as of last year, she's actually a director at large uh, of Optica, uh, serving on this board of directors. So again, it's a particular pleasure to welcome you here, and we are looking very much forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for having me here today, and also for inviting uh, me to, to speak to all of you. It's really a great pleasure, because I feel like I'm the photonics director, <laughs> somehow not in, the, not in this institute. Um, and also, as a, as a Max Planck person, we all belong to the Max Planck family, I thought before uh, giving a, my talk that I would introduce you to my current institute, it's, it's not so common that even institutes uh, intersect. Um, my institute, the MPI of Microstructure Physics, is located in Halle, in the former eastern part of Germany. And um, we are currently in this uh, main building. We are situated in uh, Weinberg Campus Technology Park. And our current building, which was built in the mid-90s, is being completely renovated. And um, the other director there, um, whom you see in the next slide, is really into colors. So we have a very colorful exterior. Uh, we also recently got a new TM building extension. You can see us like all the way down the street um, here where the tram runs. You can see us mm, a mile away because we're so colorful. Uh, oops, and uh, we will have a new building, um, much like the founding directors of this institute uh, waited for this beautiful building to be done. Uh, we will uh, have a new building. We demolish an old one and we will build a new one. It was scheduled to be completed in mid-2025 or so. Uh, there will be 800 square meter of clean room space and I will maybe move there uh, when it's done. And the, the institute right now is 150 people and we will be about 300 people uh, when this is done. Our institute has uh, three directors in total, including myself. Um, the other full-time director is Professor Stuart Parkin, and he works on atomically engineered materials, heterostructures, and he has this concept of a racetrack memory uh, that he's trying to pursue. He comes from IBM Almaden in California, he comes from industry, a very unique uh, for Max Planck Institute. Um, Xin Lang Fang uh, is from TU Dresden. He's a chemist and he started, uh, he joined us uh, 2021, so last year, and he's an organic chemist uh, synthesizing carbon nanostructures, all kinds of organic nanostructures, and his interest uh, is really in energy storage and conversion, a lot of materials for future batteries. And then there's me, and I do integrated photonics, and uh, I'll tell you more about uh, our research in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So, of course, many of us are familiar with computing, and we see this evolution over um, the past century from mechanical machines, very large uh, and discrete, uh, through the ENIAC, vacuum tubes, personal computers, and to mobile computing, cloud computing. So computing, uh, what a computer is, has evolved uh, over, over the century. And, of course, none of us could deny the impact it has had on modern society, on our daily lives. 
And as this uh, evolution took place, there's also the need for more communication. So computing and communication are often tie, are always tied together. Every time you compute, you have to transmit that output, that outcome somewhere. And um, because of that, then fiber optics or optical communication also come to the fore uh, as the, as the um, uh, computing also became a uh, much larger scale and also with many more computation per unit time. And so we find that fiber optic communication, optical communication, uh, which used to be only, uh, which still is the you know, backbone for the internet of long distance communication, we find this sort of optical communication taken to shorter and shorter distances into data centers and then also uh, in between microchips today. And we see that uh, with more uh, um, communication, uh, with more computation, there's also much more photonics that we find integrated closer to the computation for communication. And because of this demand for um, Com high bandwidth uh, communication links, we find that there's a need to also make lower in, in computing systems that we find that we need to be able to create more complex photonic uh, uh, devices and photonic circuits for that communication purposes in, in a computing center uh, for uh, in, in a low cost and manufacturable way. And that's how this uh, field of foundry silicon photonics has really emerged and developed in the last 10 years or so, 10, 15 years or so. And the idea of foundry silicon photonics is to be able to manufacture photonic chips using microelectronic uh, infrastructure in a microelectronics foundry. So in the electronics world, I'm sure many of you uh, would know that the, the, the fabrication has become so complicated and the circuitry that has been created for our uh, processors are so complex that you don't do it in a university clean room. No electronics engineer goes into the clean room to make their own chips anymore. Um, this is done in a professional factory, you know, we'll call a foundry, to make these um, uh, electronic circuits. And photonics is also moving along this line. Um, and the idea is to leverage the expertise and all the investments that have been made for silicon microelectronics in, uh, to make photonics uh, at scale. And uh, this has uh, grown to become a billion dollar scale industry. There are a number of um, R&D as well as commercial scale uh, foundries that are manufacturing these uh, uh, silicon photonic uh, uh, chips. And they're usually done on 200 or 300 millimeter wafer uh, processes. And they, you can also, because you can mix so many chips, you can also then um, have many components sort of to co-integrate with, um, with other devices, like with other kinds of chips, like a microelectronic chip, for example. And a typical silicon photonics uh, platform for data communication today um, is um, has been designed to be used for communication wavelengths, uh, 1.3 microns uh, or 1.5 micron wavelengths. And this is the cross section. Um, uh, you have uh, waveguides that are defined on the top layer of a silicon on insulator wafer. So uh, this is the waveguide layer and beneath this is this buried oxide layer and it sits on a silicon substrate. There are some edge steps uh, to create gratings and waveguides, uh, rip waveguides that are doping to create PN junctions, to make modulators, uh, phase shifters. You could have the germanium, which is smaller band gap than silicon, uh, and uh, to absorb light at, um, at these telecom wavelengths up to um, 1.6 microns. There's often now also silicon nitride layer integrated for better passive devices. And there are also ways, which I won't go into today, of integrating lasers. And this has led to a lot of commercialization activity. So Intel now is the leading supplier of transceiver single mode fiber at 100 gig uh, in the world. Um, they dominate the market. There's also a lot of effort in co-package optics, so packaging the uh, photonic chips with uh, very close to electronic uh, computing processors. Um, AR Labs is a, um, is a startup out of uh, um, MIT, and, um, and this is, uh, they're getting, gaining a lot of momentum, a uh, huge investment by NVIDIA, uh, re announced uh, recently, uh, again, to commercialize uh, silicon photonics for communication in a computer. And then also there's an emergence of um, the special purpose compute engines, I call them. So these would be, well, light matter is a good example of this. So these are photonic circuits that can do machine learning uh, acceleration. 
and they all use this sort of conventional uh, uh, platform that you could now access um, through these multi-project wafer shuttles. So that's what they're called. They're, they're standard uh, cross sections that you could um, you could buy uh, area design area from a foundry to have your chips made. And as we look forward um, beyond uh, the needs of computing today, um, what do I think are the most important uh, problems? Um, and I see the problems and the opportunities uh, at the two extreme scales. So at the very, very large scale systems, we talk about the, the data centers or the high performance supercomputers, there's of course a need to reduce the power consumption, uh, reduce the latency, reduce the delay so you can compute faster. So some of you may know that there are very large um, neural networks that are now being deployed and run, and that's how we can do Google Translate um, at any instant. I search for Google images, Google videos, everything. Um, but behind this, um, the backbone of this is these really large neural networks that run on giant data centers, and they take lots of energy. And it is really a question of if we were to imagine the future of computing, where I, I think AI it's going to be with us, so we cannot ignore it. Um, how are these really large neural networks going to be deployed, trained? Uh, are we going to need um, little <laughs> nuclear power stations? These are all big questions because right now it's really at the limit of the energy, uh, the, the energy footprint of doing these machine learning uh, models is not insignificant uh, anymore. Um, and so these are the large compute problems, um, and we benefit from the large compute problems. So you, I, I think that's another, it, it affects our daily lives. And then the other extreme, uh, the portable system also affects our daily lives. This is the computer we carry all the time with us. And I don't know about you, but like now if my phone is not within arm's reach of me, I get a little nervous. So, um, but what would be the future computing interface um, uh, beyond the, the phone or, or wearable watch? So I think optics has a role to play in both of these scales. Um, at the large, very large scale, then uh, we can think of new ways of doing uh, uh, new, computer, new computing architectures, new ways of doing computing. So I would say quantum computing belongs to that category, neuromorphic computing, and maybe shorter term, these hardware accelerators. So a very specific um, uh, accelerator to, to, to really reduce the energy cost and speed up certain computation, like these vector matrix multiplications in neural networks. And then at the very uh, other end of the extreme, where you very you want to be um, energy efficient, very compact scale, then I think then the 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 opportunity there are new form factors for um, for for computers. And I think in the nearer term, maybe within the next ten years, I can imagine everyone wearing smart glasses, so we're not always looking down on the phone. Uh, maybe they can have instant German translator in, in my ear, so I I don't have to check all the time what's going on. On. Um, everything is just translated right in front of my eyes. But right now, these uh, smart glasses are very bulky. I was talking to Mario uh, before in the morning, and he, um, yeah, we were talking about yeah, how smart glasses are like. This is the, the state of the art, the highest end today. A smart glass from Microsoft is called a HoloLens. Very expensive, like five, five thousand, four thousand, five thousand uh, euros. Um, uh, you will, you'll need permission from your procurement office to buy it, and um, and um, but you don't want to wear this all the time. It looks really ugly, and you can see that it, the the display. Actually, a lot of this uh, in front, as it turns out, the the bulk is optics. Okay, it's not the only thing that's in here, but optics is a big part of this. So, um, could we miniaturize this? Um, and you can see also that the the, there's a visor here is dimmed because the display is not bright enough. So you have to block the regular light, uh, room ambient light, so you can actually see uh, what's being projected. It doesn't work in, in, in daylight. So these are all open questions. It's not something you would wear um, every time. But I also think you know the BlackBerry, which is the first smartphone, it was not something you everyone has. And now, who doesn't have a smartphone? So. I think that um, it's a new form factor, lots of technical challenges, but a lot of the problems are optical. Um, and then uh, looking further into the future, um, many decades from now, uh, if, the, if we're always wearing a computer, could a computer just be inside us? So could a computer be completely implanted or chip implanted um, in us? And that would enhance our cognitive capabilities. 
in, in this context of these extreme <laughs> scales of very large and very small computing, I think photonics is very important. So for um, new types of computing, like quantum computing, then we would need photonic chips that can manipulate atoms and ions. And those photonic chips are not the ones that are working in the telecom wavelengths necessarily. They, work, they should work in the visible spectrum where a lot of the atomic transitions are. For displays, the beam scanners and so on, laser scanning would, would be in the visible spectrum. And of course, there's lots of um, uh, new application in um, biology and sensing that will also be in the visible spectrum. So integrated photonics for the visible spectrum could be extremely uh, useful in, in these new areas of, of work. And certainly here uh, at this institute, uh, Johan uh, and, and Vahid do a lot of work with uh, microscopy, uh, biosensing. And I want to emphasize that despite uh, uh, you know, moving into this visible spectrum for integrated photonics on silicon, it doesn't mean that you, you break the rules on the benefits of silicon photonics. So silicon photonics, many, many people think that, well, you have to guide light in silicon. That's the platform that you have today. This is what you will buy from iMac um, and so on, or, or, or Leite. Um, but it's not true. What, what the benefits of silicon photonics is to make the photonic circuits in, in the electronic manufacturing process. You could use a different waveguide, not silicon, as long as it's compatible with the fabrication flow. And there are many materials in CMOS, anyway, they're using CMOS, uh, microelectronics, that is not silicon uh, today already. And so along those lines, then there have been efforts by a number of groups around the world and foundries around the world to integrate a, a material that is transparent in the visible spectrum, but that is also compatible with the silicon microelectronic process um, and, and do that at scale at 200 or 300 millimeter wafer. So this is all done, um, most of them are done in foundries and um, you yeah, still leveraging the benefits of silicon photonics, but now being able to guide light in the visible spectrum where silicon, of course, would be absorbing. And as you can see, this is just a, a compilation of these efforts um, on, on these large wafers and um, they are, they fall into uh, effectively two categories of, of, uh, of, of uh, waveguide, the main waveguide uh, material choice. So the silicon nitride or aluminum oxide. And there are um, different kinds of silicon nitride, low temperature deposition, there's high temperature deposition. Um, and the, the waveguide losses here have improved over time. So even a few dB uh, per centimeter is possible now. Um, however, I should caution that some of these um, uh, loss values are, may not be quoted for single mode uh, waveguides. So it's, the waveguides tend to be higher loss for single mode when they're single mode because um, it will be that the, a lot of the loss is dominated by sidewall uh, roughness scattering. And so um, a highly confining a small waveguide uh, would have higher losses than a larger, uh, larger cross-section area in which you don't see the sidewall. So, so the, not all the papers say whether it's single mode or not, um, but nonetheless, uh, the, I just wanted to put these out there that, that it's not, um, they can have pretty good performance. And the um, aluminum oxide uh, work coming out of the MIT LinkedIn labs is, uh, has been quite uh, exciting and very good also to get even very low losses in the UV region where um, it's, it's quite challenging. Uh, a lot of the silicon nitride work so far cannot go to um, less than 400 or so nanometer wavelength. So I'd like to now share with you um, the efforts in my group, and I'd like to acknowledge um, the people who do all the hard work. I'm just a spokesperson for the um, hardworking people in my team. Uh, I especially want to highlight the work of Wesley Satcher, who is a, um, a group leader in my department right now, um, but there were also many uh, postdocs and students uh, involved in this project. And this project is in close collaboration with Advanced Microfoundry, AMF, uh, in Singapore, uh, with, uh, with whom we've had a long collaboration with uh, over many projects. And they, uh, from telecom work that I was doing in Toronto to this new work. With uh, AMF, uh, we over, um, 
a six-year-long period, after, after six years or so now, we finally arrived at our very first generation uh, platform uh, earlier this year. And this is all done on the 200 millimeter line uh, with 193 nanometer DPUV lithography. Our current platform uh, looks like this. Um, it has two layers of silicon nitride waveguide. It was formed on bulk silicon, but we create a meso etch to have um, PN and have PN junction um, uh, implants here. This forms the photo detector, which I will briefly explain uh, in a in a slide or so. And then um, there's an undercut here to create suspended regions, which are used. Uh, in, to create very efficient heaters, uh, thermal optic phase shifters, and also to create uh, some mechanical devices. Uh, the two layers of routing metals. And, and this uh, effort uh, should lead to the process design kit release retargeting next year. So we're working towards um, uh, having more runs and testing things um, out. And hopefully, we, maybe AMF would be able to release that to the public uh, next year. And here are some of the components that form part of this uh, PDK, or process design kit, uh, this platform that we have created. Um, the, their single mode waveguides, the losses of two uh, dBs per centimeter, uh, the 650 nanometer and five dB per centimeter, 450 nanometer wavelength. So not, not as low loss as some of the examples that I showed earlier, but these are for single mode waveguides. We have, we use the two layers of nitride to get a very good a coupling with optical fiber. The top layer of nitride is actually thinner uh, than, than the bottom. And because the layer uh, appears thinner, the mode um, at the edge becomes uh, more expanded spatially and it has better coupling to a single mode fiber in the visible spectrum. So the spot size uh, diameter is about three microns for the single mode fiber. Um, but the, uh, as it turns out, I don't, show it here, but the mode in the silicon nitride uh, nominal routing waveguide here is very confined. And so um, before uh, having this two layer uh, coupler, the loss per coupling into one facet was almost 10 d 8 dB per facet. And with this, uh, with this design in which the light couples first to this top layer and then adiabatically transfer to the main routing layer on the chip, we can get 4 dB uh, per facet. You have to come into the chip, you get, get out of the chip, so, so we can get um, just 8 dB instead of 16 dB uh, loss. So this is a, a very big improvement uh, for us. And this is very broadband, it uh, works across the entire visible spectrum. There are also these thermal optic phase shifters, which I told you about. Uh, we use this undercut to thermally isolate um, a, a beam <laughs> from its surrounding. And the, um, the titanium nitride is a resistive uh, metal that, uh, so that you can when you apply current, uh, you can resistively heat the titanium nitride and then um, warm up the, this region here and then, sh and then uh, shift the uh, refractive index to the thermal optic uh, coefficient. And um, because silicon nitride uh, has a th silicon nitride thermal optic coefficient is about five times less than that of silicon, then typically thermal optic uh, phase shifters in silicon nitride are not very efficient. But um, by, by doing this undercut and also by wrapping, uh, by placing several waveguides underneath the heater, we can use the heat more effectively. And so we could create uh, these phase shifters that have a P pi of 8.8 .8 milliwatt at 445 nanometers, this visible wavelength. Um, P pi is the power it takes to do a pi phase shift. And the, um, for reference, uh, a silicon phase shifter that had no undercut, like a, a very standard one, uh, run-of-the-mill uh, type of a phase shifter, the P pi is about 10 milliwatts. So um, this is a very low uh, uh, power phase shifter, um, and it's, very it's a very practical and useful device. So we can build these mock sender interferometers on the chip. Uh, waveguides are wrapping uh, back and forth a few times underneath the heater to have an energy uh, efficient heater. And then we also created a photo detector on this, on this platform. And this uh, platform is the only one that I know of uh, that actually has photo detectors and waveguides, like all these components all together. Um, and they in the visible spectrum uh, on silicon uh, on, on these 200 millimeter wafer sizes. And our, and our photo detector has a very nice design where the light comes in on the silicon nitride waveguide. And then there is a design taper that um, uh, leaks the light into the silicon meso below. And then the light is absorbed uh, in this PN uh, photo detector. 
and we have uh, external quantum efficiency um, about 80, 60 to 80 percent across, again, the entire spectrum. Um, and it also displays uh, avalanche effects. So we are in the process of uh, testing to see if these photodetectors can be used as single photon avalanche photo detectors. But what I wanted to share with you is all those basic components. And um, if um, uh, to show you some new features that are possible, um, I want to tell you these, these new results. Um, this is uh, with using, again, in the same uh, this 200 millimeter wafer, the, the same platform, we created um, very interesting uh, MEMS uh, cantilever beam steering devices. So being able to steer beams is very uh, useful for many applications, the beam scanning displays, um, even in the uh, maybe in the near infrared region, LIDAR applications. And in the photonic circuit domain, to do a beam steering uh, effect, very often, uh, very popular these days, is to build an optical phase arrays. So you have many waveguides and you tune the phase, feeding to all these waveguides, and then you, in the far field, the output of these uh, individual waveguides will create an interference pattern um, that uh, if you phase uh, correctly, you can create a beam uh, pointing in a specific direction. So we took a different approach because we want to create a very compact uh, beam steering device and also beam steering for many technical reasons uh, with the phase array is much more challenging in the visible than in the infrared. So we decided to create an electrothermal based, a very simple electrothermally actuated MEMS cantilever. And so on this platform that we have, we have again the aluminum, which is used for the uh, top uh, bond bonding pad, and there's the titanium nitride heater that you see. And because of the difference in the uh, uh, coefficient of thermal expansion between the aluminum and the silicon dioxide, when you heat the, um, the titanium, uh, then titanium nitride, you can actually bend the beam. And um, so this is a 1D beam steering a cantilever that by then heating, uh, you could you can bend this beam up and down uh, like this. And this is uh, a CM image of beams of different lengths. And this is just due to the thermal stress, uh, due to the stress from depositing these materials on the silicon that as when they were released, then you, you, um, they, they naturally bend up just from the internal stress of the films. But as you heat up, then yeah, the beam will bend. So this is for 1D beam scanning, right? And the light, there's a grating coupler. I forgot, to, there's a grating coupler at the tip uh, of this cantilever and that uh, emits the light out and so as the beam bends up and down you're scanning in this angle. You can also stay in 2D with this two with this L-shape uh, uh, cantilever the, the two primary arms uh, that will uh, push the beam out uh, um, in, in this direction but then kind of steering the beam um, uh, in this phi direction, and then there's the other theta direction, which is the just like this one, this secondary arm flopping up and down like that. So, um, so we can you can also create 2D uh, beam scanning patterns this way, and uh, this is a, a image that you can a video showing that the beams can move around. And because this is not due to this beam steering is just due to mechanical deflection, the scanning range for all wavelengths. It's the same. Um, whereas an optical phase array, you wouldn't be able to send blue light and green light um, at the same time. Uh, but here we can; it's completely uh, agnostic to the uh, to the wavelength. Um, and here is some uh, simulation uh, and, and measurements of the of the uh, of the beam. So we could get um, a, a scanning angle of you could see about uh, 25 up to 30 degrees um, uh, is possible. So this is for the 1D scanning. You can see that there are two slopes here. Um, that's because the um, the beam uh, hits the substrate on the bottom, uh, the silicon. So that that's why the the scanning uh, range uh, changes um, at, at these powers. <coughs> Oh, sorry. And then these um, the longer beams uh, have have a longer uh, longer beams also have a higher uh, scanning angle. And then we also uh, have tested for the rise and fall time uh, here, and you can see that it's a uh, it's a few milliseconds. 
because it's a thermal effect, so it's not super fast. Um, the, the 2D cantilever uh, uh, version with 20 milliwatts applied to each arm, you can scan a 24 by 12 degree range. And uh, just for fun, then we scan, um, we program this, uh, uh, all the students program uh, the, the, the beam to raster out uh, the name of our department in all these different colors. Um, and this was done without any laser power control. And this is a very compact uh, beam steering. So we decided also because for some quantum applications, sometimes maybe this sort of chip has to go into a cryostat. Um, and we wanted to test if it works too. Uh, I forgot to mention, we also did reliability tests and over 1 billion switching cycles, there was also no degradation. And um, so we got into cryo. This is the first time in my group, in my life, to, to do a cryo experiment. Uh, um, so the chip had to be bonded, um, integrated, uh, fiber connected, and then placed into the cryostat. And we were very nice to borrow cryostat from our neighboring uh, department. It has, a, it has a very big window on the top, so we can image the beam and how far it can scan um, from the top window. Um, and uh, the, um, the, at these uh, low temperatures, there's a very high initial deflection of the beam. Um, and then uh, also with the, the also simulation agreeing very well with the experiments that we're also able to steer uh, this beam in the cryostat uh, for to, uh, up to 20 degrees. We could measure, we were limited by the viewing window uh, that's possible. So we couldn't see beyond, otherwise it gets clipped, the beam is clipped inside the cryostat. So comparing our work with um, other optical phased array approaches, uh, we see there are lots of unique advantages to doing this mechanical beam steering. First of all, it's much simpler, and the device is very small. It's just this, um, depending on the length, 500 micron long beam, or if you want shorter, 100 micron long beam, um, few, uh, like 100 uh, 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 tens of microns wide, uh, just one with one wave guide going in there and then a grading uh, you, and you can also not choose choose not to use a grading coupler at the end you can also end couple that that's also fine so um, but we're able to very simply with this very simple design do 2d beam steering um, over the entire visible wavelength range um, there are a reasonable scanning range a decent scanning range also um, and the we also drove the 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 beams are resonantly, and they have resonant frequency of uh, seven uh, kilohertz, or about 10 kilohertz, seven in one for the first uh, uh, mode, and then the uh, 17 um, kilohertz for the next resonance. So uh, in comparison, it's much simpler architecture. The number of resolvable points that we have um, can be improved. Uh, if, if we were doing gratings again, that we should use a weaker grading. We didn't specifically optimize for the number of uh, resolvable points on this uh, wafer run, but in the future with a grading that um, is weaker, we can have we can actually have a beam with a narrower full width maximum. And so then for the steering range, we'll be able to fit more, um, more points in. Uh, our steering range, as I mentioned, it was limited by the substrate that the beam just hits the bottom. So if we had a deeper undercut, we could also expand our scanning range. Um, and the big advantage is that it took very little uh, power uh, for us. So 20 milliwatts or so to do this beam scanning, whereas um, it takes two watts um, on, a, on an optical phased array. So I think this is very interesting technology and we will expand this uh, further in the coming uh, runs and try different types of, of MEMS actuation, but all done on this 200 millimeter wafer. So uh, for example, electrostatic actuation. And now in the next part of my talk, then this is the base technology. So what do we use it for? And um, we are gonna shift gears. Uh, we are very interested in using this uh, type of chip technology to investigate uh, the brain and uh, to create a new kind of brain chip interface. And to, to do that, first I have to give you a quick primer that um, in the field of neurobiology, and again in the last 10 to 15 years or so, there has been a lot of uh, development in using optical techniques to control neural activity and also to image functional uh, uh, neural activity, to be able to dissect neural circuits. So in functional optical imaging, these neurons are modified, genetically modified, such, such that they will fluoresce when they fire. 
And so you can then use a um, multi-photon microscope to then <laughs> do a scan, scan and be able to capture this fluorescence and be able to see uh, uh, the, the actual, to actually image in, in the 3D volume the neuroactivity. And because these neurons um, are actually genetically uh, modified, you can target very specific types of neurons such that they fluoresce. So this is um, very different from uh, just imaging everything at the same time, in which, because there's so many neurons, there's a lot of optical scattering, you might not be able to decipher what you're looking at. So this genetic encoding gives you that um, extra kind of filter, if you wish, or control to manipulate a very specific type of neurons and, you know, and to watch a very specific type of neurons, I mean, just the imaging part. And the optogenetics um, is the other complementary technique where, again, very specific types of neurons, genetically uh, targeted, are modified such that they can be turned on or turned off with light. And this is, again, deterministic. So you can selectively uh, turn on a certain population of neurons and see what the behavior would be, or turn on neurons and maybe image and follow up with optical imaging to see uh, what, what, what is the, um, the pattern activity. And you can also turn off uh, very specific uh, populations of neurons. And this is the control, um, this is the monitoring. So you can actually do all optical control and monitoring of, of neural activity. And this type of uh, tool is very exciting for the neurobiology community because the, um, the optogenetics is deterministic. You, you know that when you shine the light um, for, for certain opsin, the proteins that are expressed, you know that either you're gonna act, uh, increase activity or you can inhibit activity. You can know that a priori. So this is a, a big revolution that's happening in the neuroscience community, um, but the tools that they use right now generally are you know, big tabletop tools. This is the two photon microscope in my lab in Hull now. It's a big optical table system, very large. And then these, um, this you can buy also from Thor Labs. Uh, these cannulas are implanted into the, meant to be implanted into the brain of some animals. Um, and, and then you have fiber optics to, um, to turn on or to sunlight into the brain. But as you can imagine, coming from the chip world, then I see, ah, there's so much more that can be done than these big microscopes. And so we are very interested in creating very small chips that can be implanted into brains so that we can create a lot of um, function also that are co-integrated. Moreover, um, by having these implantable neural probes, so this is a, 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 a CAD drawing of one, that we are able to also then bring light to, to depths uh, that are inaccessible from free space into the brain. So with op due to optical scattering in the tissue, um, when you shine light from a microscope into the tissue, you can only penetrate maybe about a millimeter uh, from, from the surface but the cortex is um, uh, of, of a mouse is about three millimeters thick, human up to five to six millimeter thick. So you won't be able to see very deeply uh, in the cortex and at least coming from free space, you cannot look at deeper structures like the hippocampus. But if you do a, a, a implant like a chip that can, that can actually bring the light into the, into the animal, then uh, that's one way of accessing deeper regions um, uh, of the brain with light. We can co-integrate optical, of course, electrophysiology, electrodes, and also chemical sensors, fluidics uh, onto these probes. Uh, and so that can also be done. And finally, uh, very importantly, I, I believe, is that we have to use foundry manufacturing to make these probes because in the neuroscience and the biology community, the biologists do not just run one experiment. There are many, many mice. They have to take many data, many um, uh, runs, and also uh, the community is large. So we, in order to execute something like this, a chip like this at volume, we have to use a foundry to do this and also to make an impact. And so again, then working with our good friends at, uh, in Singapore at AMF, they're very nice to us because these projects are so exploratory and so crazy, but they've always been um, willing to try new processes. So working again with AMF uh, since around 2016, 2017 with the Visible Light platform, we've now developed a whole process to make uh, neural probes on, in the silicon photonics line. Um, and this entire wafer uh, is thinned down to about uh, 50 to 100 microns thick uh, to in the probe. And we can do post-processing in our lab after to further thin down to about 30 microns thick. Uh, very, very thin, uh, minimally sort of disturbing the tissue. And here's some pictures of these uh, probes done on that line. And 
and then the, yeah, we can have, we have a way of addressing uh, these uh, transmitters. I should also mention that AMF is a commercial foundry. So normally they sell, they make chips for optical communication. Um, so this is, um, so don't think that you, they do this every day. Um, it's a very special project. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, the, my team and collaborators. Again, Wesley is very involved, and I'd like to very much highlight uh, the work of uh, Fred Chen, of Fudo Chen. He is a PhD student in my, in my department. I came uh, from Toronto, and a lot of the work you see here, uh, he is, um, has been instrumental in pushing that through. And he's co-supervised with uh, my collaborator, Dr. Uh, Tofik Valiente, um, and uh, in, at the University Health Network in Toronto, uh, Cromwell Brain Institute. And uh, Tofik and his team uh, have been very, very kind and generous <laughs> uh, in uh, helping us do a lot of the biology uh, experiments. And some of these students, uh, David uh, and Rakshith, are co-supervised uh, with me uh, um, here. So just very briefly then, um, first I'll introduce some of the work that has been um, uh, more out there, have been published uh, for last year. Uh, we've started with photonics only uh, neuroprobes, and um, one uh, application that we could immediately target and bring a new capability that would be very hard to do without without a probe was to make a um, a, a light sheet microscopy probe uh, for non-transparent organisms. So by designing the gratings on this neural probe such that they can emit a um, through overlapping grating emission, emit a sh plane, a sheet of light, then this um, type of probe can be implanted into um, say this animal and then by addressing different sheets on this uh, probe that and then we can image from the top and we can do a light sheet microscopy in this way. Conventional light sheet microscopes, things you might buy uh, from a company, they use lenses to form the light sheets. And uh, just due to the geometry of the lens and so on, you cannot actually image a non-transparent organism. You can only image uh, zebrafish larvae, for example, because there isn't enough space to fit a mouse in uh, between all the lenses. And so we... Um, we did was then we tested this uh, in fixed tissue, and then we find that with the light sheet probe, you can see much higher contrast for the neurons than if you used uh, epifluorescence microscopy. Uh, we could also we also did functional imaging in ex vivo tissue and also in vivo experiments. And then another photonics only probe that we did was uh, an optical beam steering probe, and the, actually the first steering probe was just published uh, earlier this year. And the, but the, but the better version is the one that I will describe here. Um, so this uh, beam steering probe has only a single lobe of emission, even though it uses an optical phased array. So the light comes in here from, uh, from the input waveguide, and then it goes into a, um, a, a star coupler dividing the power into 16 uh, waveguides, and then uh, 16 delay lines uh, here. And then due to the delay lines here with the differential fixed delay, then you end up with a phase shift among all of these light emission spots. And then by then tuning the wavelength uh, of the input, you're changing the phase, um, phase difference uh, between these uh, waveguides, and then you could uh, change the emission angle of the light inside this, um, emitted into this free propagation region slab. And then the beam will then come out uh, onto the emitting region and then shoot out of the grating. And because we have uh, this free propagation region, oh, okay, there's a picture here, any side lobes that are formed can be clipped off um, by by the slab before it reaches the end. So here's an example. So there's only one beam uh, that reaches the end. And then as you change the wavelength, the beam is sweeping across this grating. And then at some point, you're, you're towards the end of this uh, single lobe uh, region. And you can see the other lobe, the side lobe, from this um, uh, um, end fire optical phase array emerging from the other side. So this will have two lobes uh, coming out, which is not desirable. Um, and this was done again on the neural probe. So this is very interesting. You can because of the nanophotonic technology, you can do fairly complex photonic designs, but all <laughs> integrated in this in this stick uh, that you could put into brain tissue. Um, and uh, it's pretty it's pretty crazy to think about it that way, but it's also very exciting. Um, and uh, this is a f uh, image of the beam coming out of the of this uh, probe. The beam comes out sort of perpendicular to the plane of the of the of the probe here, and you can see that there's only a single lobe of beam emission. 
Um, here are some of the specs of the probe. Um, the the beam, beam width is um, not super narrow, admittedly, like maybe 10 microns or so, about 100 microns away. But this, uh, since the, ne the neuron cell body size is about 10 microns, so this is uh, actually, even though it's not the smallest spot, um, ever, but it's definitely not diffraction limited, but it's certainly wide enough to just target one cell uh, thickness, one cell size. Um, and so this work is ongoing to test it in tissue and in vivo and so on. Um, and um, in parallel, what, we have, uh, what Fred has also been doing um, is to uh, uh, create probes that integrate multiple functions. So now we have um, probes that have both waveguides and also surface recording electrodes. Um, and all of this is again made at AMF in their foundry, uh, in that foundry line. And you can see that for the, for the electrophysiology we, electrodes, we use our friendly titanium nitride, which we saw earlier, which is the uh, resistive uh, material for, for heating. And now we use it as the surface uh, electrode. And this is our, our cross section, um, and we're able to then integrate uh, both uh, grating couplers and electrodes like that on along the same uh, along the same shank. And um, here are some uh, specs for this uh, of this device. Um, you could again do OPAs uh, with optical phaser for beam steering with the electrodes nearby, so it can record electrical activity while steering a beam around in tissue. You can also do light sheet uh, microscopy, uh, light sheet stimulation, and uh, you can look from the top if we want for microscopy, with delivering light sheet, and also recording uh, electrical uh, signals, the electro through electrophysiology recording using these electrodes. And one uh, trick that we did was, as fabricated, the electrodes um, from AMF looked like that, but the impedance um, was quite high. And so with such high, like sort of uh, five um, mega ohm impedance, you cannot get good quality recordings. So the, rec the impedance has to be less than about one mega ohm. And, um, and we tried different methods. And at the end, Fred ended up using our two photon microscope, the laser, to roughen the surface. Uh, to, that was the most practical way um, um, to create this roughening pattern and then the, without damaging other, um, other parts of the chip. And then we could get down to about 0.8 mega ohm uh, uh, for the electro, so it's good enough for recording. The um, neural probe, um, actually, uh, I was talking to Vahid earlier, and it's, um, you know, the chip is only a small part of the story. So everyone loves the chip, and, and this is <laughs> all the students gravitate to the chip. But, the, but to be useful, you actually need the whole supporting system around it. And to get it into a neuroscience lab, you, it has to be usable in a very different environment from your optics lab. And so in the past couple of years since starting in the, in the MPI, we've also spent a lot of efforts to, to develop all the peripherals um, that surround our chip so that our chip could actually be useful. Okay, so I'll talk briefly about these um, systems that we've built. So first, um, the optical addressing. So this is our setup in, back in Toronto. And the way we do the addressing on the probe um, is to keep it actually, most of it off of the probe chip. And before we had this optical table long system where the laser, there's a laser light coming in um, and it hits a MEM scanning mirror like this. And then the light is then coupled into a, um, a Fujikura fiber bundle, commercially available fiber bundle. And then by scanning the mirror, you can address different cores in this imaging fiber bundle. Okay, and then, so this is the cross section, and then this fiber bundle is then coupled to match to the input waveguides on the end of the probe. And then by addressing different input waveguides on this chip, on this probe chip, we can light up different gratings. Okay, so this is actually how we, um, um, this is actually how we, we send light into the probe. Um, and we did this on purpose because we were, we've been very worried about uh, generating heat on the probe. Um, the, the tissue cannot be even more than one degree uh, hotter. Okay, so, so this is our, our system. We call this now the macro scan. Um, and then this is actually extremely difficult to use um, and very kind, for, uh, 
uh, Tofik Valiente was very kind to let us go into his lab and build this um, <laughs> in Nixer's experiments. But now um, at the uh, at the MPI with uh, Hannes Vaughn, who is our optical engineer, we have uh, he has taken all this and miniaturized uh, into a 30 by 30 centimeter um, sort of now small plate. So it's actually portable. We've miniaturized everything. We also added a um, so it still has the laser and the uh, the scanning MEMS mirror here, but we added a depolarizing uh, unit also because um, due to very small fluctuations of the polarization. Um, you know, from the fiber, uh, then we can get power fluctuation in the emitted light from the grating. So the chips are very biofringent because the waveguides are highly confining and they're, and they're rectangular. And so in order to improve the coupling, we also uh, work with Corning to develop a custom 16-core uh, multi-core fiber. We, we tried to work with um, uh, the, the MPL, but it turned out that this was not so compatible with the fiber draw tower here. Uh, but we ended up with Corning uh, to have this uh, uh, fiber made. Um, and then this fiber is then uh, connected. So with the custom fiber, the nice thing is that the cores are well aligned. You can see that here they're not all in a straight line, but now they're very well positioned. And then we can integrate that to that uh, chip and then, um, and then you light up different uh, gratings. And to get better power stability, we um, depolarize the light from coming out from the laser. And then there's a, a further polarization filter on the chip to only select out, say, the TE polarization uh, that will survive and be emitted into the grating. So we take the 3 dB loss uh, this way, but the power is much more uh, stable also um, uh, over time. We also spent a lot of effort to simplify or maybe automate the packaging. Uh, it used to be that it took six hours uh, for Wesley Infrared to package a probe. Um, very, very painstaking process. And now at our institute, uh, we have a custom machine uh, with Fecon Tech uh, that, does a optical, uh, that does assembly of these neural probes. And this also took more than two years. Uh, Fred led, man, man, was the project manager <laughs> for, the, for developing this uh, machine with Fecon Tech. Um, to, it's like a German company um, to, to have a semi-auto made, made a way of packaging the neural probes of attaching the fiber to the chip. And now uh, it takes only a couple of hours to do this, um, and um, we could get uh, about 10 dB of, of loss. We also uh, spend a lot of energy to uh, integrate the, the electronics, and there's a flex. Uh, John uh, Straguzzi is the electronics engineer in my department, um, and uh, he was also very good at uh, designing the, the interfaces for this, and uh, yeah, we now the current approach is to wire bond onto a flex PCB, but with a kind of a hard uh, substrate holding this. And then, then at the other end of this flex cable, it's connected to a commercially available amplifier with an analog to digital converter and then into an open source uh, data acquisition box. Um, and uh, ongoing effort, uh, we are collaborating with the Max Planck uh, Hoplite Labor, the semiconductor lab, to uh, make denser um, integration, actually, to, uh, with a silicon interposer. This is with LASI uh, at XLL. Uh, and this is very new, and I'm very excited about this. So Fred, only a couple, of, like two weeks old data. And so uh, Fred has been in Toronto trying to do in vivo experiments. So our institute does not have animal facility there are no nearby animal facilities um, uh, that we could uh, deploy our experiments easily um, uh, where in, in Halle. So we go back to uh, a very good collaboration with Tofik Valente. We test our neuroprobes and the animals uh, in, in Toronto. So Fred has been there for a few months uh, trying to do these measurements. And uh, this is the first test of our probe that has both integrated photonics and electrodes. Um, and um, so this is the spontaneous activity from, from an anesthetized mouse uh, from some of these electrodes. And then by turning on a grading emitter, so the gratings uh, here interspersed with electrodes, by turning on grading emitter one here, we can see that this increased uh, electrophysiology activity that can be measured in a nearby uh, electrode. So channel three, for example, and uh, with some spike sorting, you can identify the neurons that are responsible for that spike. Uh, there's also a bit of extra activity you can see in channel one as well, which is the closest uh, also to this beam that's coming out. It's a bit, it'll be angled and coming out of the plane of this chip. 
Um, and then if we light another uh, a grating, 16 down here, then it's the electrodes near this uh, uh, grating emitter that would have increased uh, C extra activity. So um, this is very exciting. It's the very first time to have so many optical emitters and electrodes <laughs> all on the same uh, probe. And this could be a very useful tool for um, new neurobiology experiments uh, moving forward that you could uh, point beams in a very specific location and then record uh, electrical activity as well. So this is the overall system uh, here, and um, there's still a lot of work uh, to be done. And uh, we're also very interested in doing feedback control, too, because now we can record electrically, we can stimulate optically, so it's very natural to think of feedback um, of, the neuro, uh, of, the, of the brain. And then in this very final uh, slide, I just want to tell you, share with you some of our next steps. Uh, we are doing uh, uh, microfluidic integration on our chips, so we can, we want to be able to do chemical sensing, drug delivery, um, and we've been in discussion with Michael Frost here to maybe simplify some of this uh, packaging that we have. Uh, we also are uh, interested in, we got into 3D printing uh, of brain tissue, um, and this is um, also embedded with some optical sensors. This is a dopamine uh, sensor, it's a tetrapod zinc oxide. I didn't have time to talk about it, but it's an optical <laughs> sensor. We're able to, to uh, image um, um, neurochemicals, dopamine in this case, in 3D, um, and in this engineered brain tissue. Uh, but we have another very exciting uh, area that we are um, building up on, and a uh, large part also due to uh, activity of Wesley, the uh, group leader, and some master's student. Uh, we are building up uh, capabilities and a, a program in uh, computational imaging. So one of the holy grails would be able to do imaging uh, without these uh, microscopes and to be able to image in 3D and in this very non-invasive way. And um, the lenses actually are kind of bulky things. Yet, at the same time, it should be possible if you're able to capture all of the signal without any lenses, it's sort of all junky, but if you are able to know some uh, properties of the, of the medium that you're imaging, you, one should be able to reconstruct all of the 3D uh, volumetric information. And uh, light field imaging, for example, is a technique that can be done. So we are applying that to uh, make a miniature uh, microscope uh, for that. And also with, um, uh, for example, fiber bundle imaging, the image of fiber bundle and uh, put the probe in to form a light sheet and uh, imaging just with um, fiber bundle many, many cores. So um, this can be possible. And then, oh, and then I skipped this one. So, so in order to, uh, but this is also very interesting. So this is also very new, um, and it comes from the work of Hannes, our optical engineer. So because we have to do all this computational imaging, um, we started to find that we don't have enough data. Um, you know, you, otherwise you have to take animals or image. So we don't always have enough data. So Hannes created a model of the tissue <laughs> to, to create a, a digital version, digital twin of fluorescent tissue. And here, um, there are, uh, it's completely computer generated, but when I first saw this picture, I thought it was really from an experiment. Um, and he just simulates from simulations um, of embedding like 50 um, uh, emitters of, with time dependence as though they were blinking neurons through a, a scattering model and then tracing that over time. And uh, it takes about 30 hours to run one frame, maybe the ways of accelerating, but you could then create these um, digital model of the tissue with neuroactivity, and then, then we can use our, we can test our reconstruction on this sort of digital version of the data, and we can create a lot more sets of data without having colonies of animals and doing many animal experiments. So that is um, something we're trying uh, to do. It's very, very new uh, in my department, but I, I find it very exciting because the first time two weeks ago when Hannes showed me, I thought this was actually from the lab, um, but when he said no, it was a, a simulation, I just think this is a very exciting way of doing research and maybe accelerating research in the future. Um, and also then, yeah, this is the uh, imaging um, reconstruction with the fiber bundle. This is a work of patient uh, master student. Um, and so we can integrate our probe also with uh, imaging fiber bundle uh, here. And we, the idea here is to do volumetric uh, image reconstruction with, the, with this, um, by collecting light from this fiber bundle. So I don't have time to talk about that in detail today, but um, this is again through, through a sim uh, computation reconstruction. 
So just summarizing, um, I have shown you how uh, using silicon photonics um, in the foundry, where you can still you can create a new class of components. And there are many applications, but the one that we focused on is for uh, brain implants, <laughs> for having new tools for neuroscientists to do brain recording and brain stimulation. And this is maybe the ultimate form of computer in the future. But in the in the meantime, we can also do AR glasses. We can do quantum <laughs> quantum computing uh, too. And there are many opportunities for uh, devices and platforms and integration approaches. And I thought that this is just showing how when with integrated pharonics, with the chip technology, you can really create capabilities that you couldn't do um, with microscopic or bulk components. We had gone from a very big scanning system, mini scan, uh, optimizing the optical layer, ZMAX and so on. Now we have a beam that can do 2D scanning, and then we put it uh, then into the brain to enable brand new neuroscience experiments. And so there are many opportunities ahead, also many challenges, um, but you know, the, you can all come and join this wonderful adventure. Beth, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Um, also, just again, acknowledge the people who do the hard work uh, here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the fantastic talk, Joyce. And now my colleague Hanif Fatai will take over to moderate the question period. Nice talk. Uh, thanks a lot. Oh, hi, Dirk. Uh, <laughs> the question on the uh, on your paper uh, for people who do quantum, it's of course super interesting. Can you can you talk a bit about sort of the Noise performance, is it, is, is it under reverse bias? Yeah, it's under reverse bias. Um, the dark current, if I remember, because in the pico amps, um, maybe one nano amp and sub uh, nano amp. And this is a, um, yeah, it's just a PN uh, uh, junction. We didn't test at low temperature. So all the measurements so far are room temperature measurements. Um, and uh, we, let's see, for the noise, yeah, we only measured the dark current. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, under reverse bias. This is a fairly standard sort of silicon flow detector in that respect. Uh, we, yes, um, for the, so that we had two types of uh, flow detectors were made, PIN and PN junction. Um, the PN junction do exhibit avalanche breakdown and it has an avalanche gain uh, that we saw. Uh, I think the avalanche gain was 1700. Let's see if we can go back. Um, I think the specs were, yeah, I didn't too spend too much time on, on this. Yeah, 1700 at minus 17 volts. Um, yeah, they, they were, um, they had different lengths also. Uh, we try 50 micron, 100, 500 micron um, length, and uh, you can get different uh, also optoelectronic bandwidth, OE bandwidth. We were limited by instrumentation, so we saw up to about um, uh, 10 gigahertz, but it, in simulation, we because we also do a TCAT, to design this, you have to actually simulate first the implant and the diode and then, then the whole thing. <laughs> um, so they, from the simulation, like what the junction would be, um, so the simulation shows that this should work at 20 gigahertz, but we couldn't test at the, that bandwidth. Hello. Um, we've been working for a while on uh, biocompatibility of implants in the brain. Mm. And I was just wondering what is the overall flexibility of your probe and what is the local stiffness? Um, we, we have not measured it mechanically. I thought maybe we could work together. I don't know how to do that measurement. Um, we don't have that measurement. But we do know that we, we can see that it can bend um, when it goes into the tissue. So the, um, we are at... Uh, we th uh, when when it's thick like 100 microns it doesn't it's just t totally straight but um at um when we now thin down to 35 microns then you you can actually see it kind of bend a bit and then it can go in yeah 
and to keep that in the brain for extended periods of time like these? Or? Um, we so far have only done acute experiments, um, but the it should be at least with the with the silicon probes as like with only electrodes only um, experiments. Uh, they at this sort of thickness they they have also done chronic implants. Yeah, so the neural pixel project uh, uh, with a lot of electrodes also have very thin uh, silicon like this, and they have done uh, chronic experiments. Problem is that you get a, a foreign body reaction if the mm. mechanics is not right. Oh, and also the surface uh, should probably, we have to see um, for us whether there'll be long-term, we haven't done any long-term experiments, but there could also be coding uh, on the, uh, the probe may have to be coded as well. Second question about the simulations of the, the optical properties of the brain, of the mm. tissues. How, how do you do that? Because, I mean, that would be quite cool to know what the optical properties of the brain are at, and at, at what detail do you simulate that? Oh, this one is just with a, with a scattering model um, and then with these point sources in the, in the, in the tissue. Just the random scattering. Yeah, so, so far, yeah. But we, yeah, it would be very interesting and there will be further steps, like we were, even talking about that, uh, yes, uh, last Thursday, uh, last, oh, no, just on Tuesday, all the days are mixed up. Yeah, we were talking about, yeah, in the future, then first you do this, it looks very real, but then it is not, it's not corresponding to any specific area. But if we know, we do know that different areas of the brain have different scattering properties, so wouldn't it be interesting to build that in? And wouldn't it be even interesting to build out the, the signaling, the flashing, patterns actually correspond to real neural activity. But right now it's just um, put some blinking spots <laughs> through sky, but tracing uh, a lot of rays to generate this sort of uh, image. Yeah, yes, definitely. Thank you very much for this uh, nice talk. I have a question on the data you were showing on slide 30. Actually, I have two questions there. So, okay. Yes. Um, so my question is: first, um, you have a certain optical pulse width, and is there a lower limit to this pulse width? So, is there a minimum pulse width you need so that the neuron basically can react? And the second question would be, you also have a certain rep rate. And what is basically the minimum uh, distance between two pulses so that the neuron reacts? So is there like a dark time for the neuron? Um, yes, yeah, there is. So um, there are different types of experiments that one could choose to do. So here we turn on about 50 milliseconds, then turn it off for, I think, maybe 200 milliseconds, turn it on again. Um, there are other experiments where maybe light is kept on certainly longer. That's fine if you want to see a lot of stimulation and then turn it off. You can also do burst, bursting signals every millisecond or something. It's, it's also the, 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 depending on the neuroscience experiments you, you wish to do. So this is just, um, it's not meant to be like a limit or the, this is the shortest pulse or the longest pulse. Um, we do want, um, usually 10 milliseconds or longer, so we can record multiple spikes. So you know that it's not just some noise or something like that. So this was um, done with a longish pulse so that there would be a number of spikes that can be recorded. But there are, there are patterns that are much shorter uh, uh, bursts. And then depending on when the next burst comes, again, depends on experiments. If you want, oh, you just want to see uh, a bunch of stimulation and then wait and see what, what happens, then you, you could wait even a minute before the next burst comes. So this really depends on the neuroscience question uh, to ask. So you basically can study the um, behavior, the turning behavior of a neuron. If Correct, you like. yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I ask a question. So um, in, in the middle of your talk, you mentioned that you would like to use this um, neural probes to gather some chemical information. So I just wanted to know what is your thought um, in this direction. Right, so um, this picture, oh, I think I will just skip all the way to the end. Sorry. 
So right now, um, what we have um, so far um, is, a, uh, is a, a microfluidic channel um, post-fabricated on the probe. Um, but we do have ways of integrating more channels right into the probe, and that's being investigated uh, now. And the idea here would be that, so in this, you can't see it here, uh, because this, the, the fluid just comes in, and then um, we can inject, you can imagine injecting some drugs, <laughs> and then maybe you can do electrical recording, for example. So this is completely separate. Um, uh, the next generation, or the current generation, we are just getting the wafers back uh, from the foundry and we're testing uh, this. Um, you could imagine also then sampling the fluid, the, so you can suck out the fluid out. Um, and, and we've been talking to Michael to try to figure out a simpler packaging, but right now the idea would be to stick it, uh, stick a, a really fluidic <laughs> um, uh, connectors and so on through the end of the chip. And you can, you can then suck out uh, some fluid uh, um, um, and then the, it will go into the probe, and then we could have at the base of the probe, for example, um, micro ring sensors, right? So you can also then, do, um, if maybe just measure spectral shift, or maybe it's functionalized, so it's capturing some proteins, and you can again measure uh, this sort of refractive index sensing, uh, so an optical measurement of a chemical sample collected from the tip, and then, and then there's a kind of sensor window at the base of the probe, and then the fluid can then pump out from the end of that chip. Yeah. Oh, thank you for this uh, great overview. Um, in the beginning, when you talked about the light sheet uh, microscopy, you said this will be used in non-transparent media, um, but there has to be some transparency, so what, uh, otherwise the light sheet cannot propagate into the media. Oh, what did I mean? Yeah. So with the um, uh, conventional light sheet microscope, let's see if I have a picture. No. Oh, I think I even, oh, here. So in a conventional light sheet uh, microscope uh, setup, the sheet is formed by these two lenses, and then you image in this vertical uh, direction, and then the sheet you can scan up and down. The object. Yeah, is, the is object should be non should be quite transparent. The image transparent, but the object is not transparent. Oh, th th this should also be be quite transparent because then this this little organism would have some fluorescence that you could image, and the setup looks like these, and and the the lenses are kind of butting each other, so you couldn't fit a mouse, for example, in between. That's what I mean, and so you couldn't image. Um, uh, like mammalian brain tissue in this way. And I would say that the, the so these are some small transparent organisms here uh, that you can see. Um, but, um, but of course the tissue is um, a very scattering uh, in, the, in, in, in the mammal, so in the, in the mouse brain. Um, and so now we can just put the light, um, generate the light inside the tissue without any lenses and create that sheet. But um, so you're also right that you know, there's some transparency, otherwise there's no light in the tissue. And then um, the, the thickness of the light sheet and how far it can propagate depends on the, you know, on the scattering. Uh, of the, mm -hmm. you know. Then uh, I have a second question. Towards the end, uh, one of the last slides you, you, um, you said in, in the future you want to reconstruct the image without using any lenses. Uh, don't you have to, I mean, then you probably cannot probably do this by only measuring intensities. You probably also need to measure phases, so like um, in holography. Um, not exactly. So, for example, in um, uh, like this, this fiber bundle imaging. So you have um, uh, uh, this imaging fiber bundle, lots of fibers, and it's a bit multi-mode at these short wavelengths. And so depending on the angle of excitation of the light, like into each core of the fiber, now you can see that the shape, for example, is a bit shifted. So when you image just right here at the end, you, 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 it will look like garbage, <laughs> right? Because it's all jumbled up. Um, but with the, with the reconstruction and with, um, with references, like if you knew that, oh, this is a point source and we have these um, guide stars because our probe is there, so you know some references, you can reconstruct um, the, the object that was done. And, and so this can, so for, and, and if, 
if um, you're just collecting all the light coming from the um, from from this tip, you could also then reconstruct um, the so you, you can actually reconstruct the depth information as well. So you you do not need to have a kind of c c traditional imaging system to get uh, an image, but but you're right. You need to do some thing to, to extract that information like where from which angle is the light coming from and here the the multi mo, the multi core fiber each one slightly with a slightly multi mode you can see the patterns are changing that this can be done in a light field uh, microscope uh, light field uh, camera imaging system the on, on front of the sensor uh, image sensor there is a lens array and by uh, again the raw data would not make any sense but again, if you know that there's a lens array, so you know um, uh, if light ray was coming from a certain direction, impinging on this uh, sensor, it will look a certain way. And of course, if everything coming at the same time, you have to reconstruct. So the inclination of the wavefront. Yeah, uh, you locally. can you can you can deduce that back. Yeah. So it's, it's not just not with nothing, um, but you can figure it out. Yeah. Wow. So we start this game, right? You're very athletic. <laughs> well, I have a question. So also, thank you very much for the talk from my side. Uh, I have a question regarding the polarization. So you mentioned for this, um, so that you have some polarization-sensitive parts. Uh, so you have to kind of jitter the polarization or like um, randomize it, maybe. That's yeah. what you said. Um, but do you think there is a way, and I don't know if this is relevant for biology or not, to do polarization-sensitive probing and excitation? Yeah, that's also a great suggestion. Um, the problem is that um, our chip is polarization sensitive. Uh, actually, all of the silicon photonics <laughs> is very polarization sensitive, and uh, we were very we we're more concerned about delivering a constant uh, power um, out. So, so that's why we wanted to always be sure that the light uh, we we noticed or machines noticed that there'll be some fluctuations over time, and it's yeah, so it wasn't good for the control. The control of the experiment, right? Because if you see new increased, uh, let's say, spiking rate, you don't know if it's because you suddenly delivered a bit more power, or if it's something is actually happening biologically. So, um, so that's why we did this. But I think also uh, polarization-sensitive uh, imaging, if we could stabilize the polarization coming in, and then and, and also maybe changing that, um, but also being able to emit both T and TM. Equal, with equal efficiency, that would be, yeah, that would be a, a, another direction. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question about the, the light sheet. Uh, so, so is it correct that like there, because it's a, sh a sheet of light and you change it by frequency, you have some number of degrees of, like, you have some there's just one degree of freedom. Uh, is the hope to uh, address in three-dimensional space, like a, a larger number of individual neurons, or is it okay to just go in the? Sh in the sh um, yeah, the light sheet um, technique is um, is a volumetric imaging technique. Um, I I don't know what you mean by frequency dependent. Color. The color. That you sweep it by. Oh no no no! We sweep this by ad addressing different um, uh, different sets of grading. So this one, the wavelength was fixed. Okay. The the uh, optical phase array, we tune the wavelength to steer the beam around. And there, the tuning range um, was only about five or six nanometer uh, tuning range. Um, but the optical phase array was designed. To, to sweep out uh, the entire free spectral range within that, uh, within that narrow uh, uh, wavelength tuning range. More questions? Okay, so I also see this warning of low battery. Oh no, oh, I didn't see that, oh thank you. Yeah, so uh, please <laughs> join me. Oh yeah. Uh, let's thank uh, Professor Poon again.